All right, everyone, uh, here to talk to you over lunch, we have George Krieg. Um, you may know from uh, his role as head of international investing at William Blair. Um, he had, now has his own firm. This is Investment Analytics Miami, and uh, he's here to uh, help us uh, make better investment decisions uh, with uh, new tools we have, especially given big data, quantitative data, um, and uh, its role uh, in incorporating um, fundamental analysis and uh, intuition. Everyone, please welcome George Green. Well, it's good to be here. So we in the asset management business have a uh, have a total return problem, total returns, so not what they, what they have been over the last generation. Looking forward, we have a relative return problem. We have a uh, cheap factor problem, and, and uh, we have an active versus passive business problem. And into that, we, we you try to think about how am I going to bring, how am I going to design an investment process that will over that will overcome some of these problems and take advantage of the opportunities that still exist in uh, in in the in the asset markets themselves. And since I've just had a chance to design an investment process from scratch, I can uh, I can address that. The, the, the starting point is really to look at all of the variables that we confront in, the, in, in what I'm sort of overbearingly labeling the investment decision space here. So I, I, think, I think of this as having three different dimensions of three parts. One is the, one is the kind of the top-down, macro, sector, and company. All of those have various degrees of importance in different sectors at different times and different regimes at different points of the cycle. The second is the, the structural, cyclical, tactical problem. You know, do you do you do you love the company because it's a great company, but it's not right. It's not the right time right now, or vice versa. And the third, the third set of dimensions is the is. Are the, are the the fundamental analytics? You know, what's the total return prospect? What's the yield? What's the growth rate? What's how sustainable is it? What's the valuation? How much is the valuation going to impinge on the, on the return from from growth and yield? And in all of those things, there is a there's a there's a there's a fourth dimension that's sort of invisible and. and that spectrum is, is from 100% judgmental to 100% quantitative. And you know, you, at any time you're thinking about the prospect for an investment, it's, there's a lot of quantitative analytics in it, and a lot of times you end up saying, but I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make this judgment based on, I'm gonna make this judgment based on intuition because I think, you know, Amazon is a great company and they've proven that their strategy of waiting to defer returns into the future is good. So that's the that's the starting point for analyzing investment opportunities. The the top down bottom up disparity, the long term short term disparity, and the the and the financial analytics that go into that, and the choice between intuitive and quantitative. Uh, inputs. So what is the, what the job of the analyst then? The analyst has to, has to have an overview into, into a given investment recommendation on the basis of all of the above and they have to be able to, so they have to be able to understand all of those considerations, how they trade off against each other at any given point in time and how to apply those trade-offs in an even-handed way across the universe of companies with some reference to how that analysis relates to the state of the market as a whole. And they have to be able to do that with the correct balance 
of subjective and quantitative insight. So if you have a team of 10 analysts or 20 analysts, all you have to do is make sure that they're all doing all of those things all the time for all of their companies, and you should get good recommendations. Now, above that is the, is the function of portfolio management to integrate all those recommendations into an investment portfolio. So what the, what the portfolio management function consists of is to make sure that the analyst decision criteria are applied correctly and with the right degree of intercompany, intersector, and interfactor interpretation so that you so that you can synthesize those high quality recommendations into a portfolio that has the, the characteristics that you're that you're looking for. So that's basically the description of what the traditional active management investment process looks like. Now the problem here of course is that this gets to be this gets to astronomical levels of complexity, whether you, whether you acknowledge it or not, pretty fast. All of these trade-offs and questions that are just, that are, you know, they're hard to even relate to each other. You know, do I like Goldman Sachs because Goldman Sachs is the, is the best managed investment bank, or do I not like Goldman Sachs because I think interest rate compression and fee compression is going to be secularly bad for the banking industry. You know, you, making those kind of judgmental trade-offs, analyst by analyst, through and up through the portfolio management process, and knowing when to apply one and when to apply others, is what trips up the, the traditional investment process. So what we do as asset managers, as firms, uh, and, and as organizations, is we engage these coping mechanisms to help us deal with complexity and uncertainty. And, and the, the first one is to, is to kind of fall back on your tradition. We are an aggressive growth manager, therefore we're gonna put aggressive growth first. And I'm not gonna distract myself with worrying about whether Facebook is overvalued because all I really care about is Facebook's fundamental growth performance. Or all we care about is value. Value is reliable in the long term, so we're just gonna, we're just gonna stick with our knitting and stick with value and not try to get into too much other, too many other dimensions of the process. So, so that's one, one methodology is to, is to oversimplify. The second methodology is to, is to fall back on some biases because we have them and they're there, so why not use them? And I've used all of these and have witnessed other people using all of these. Um, and, you know, I, I, we all know that, that uh, biases basically have two functions. One is, one is to, is to confirm what you think, make you right and successful, and then, and, and the second is to trip you up later on. But everyone pulls these biases into their process, and this is part of what makes the complexity difficult to deal with, because your biases, someone else's biases are gonna be different, so the way those are applied to the decision mechanism is gonna be in conflict, and resolving that is going to be either a matter of compromise, or struggle, or delay, or uh, not making a decision, and, and all of those things have, have, can have negative impact on the, on the outcome. The, the, the third way of trying to cope with all of this is to, is to have a very comprehensive process that tries a little bit of everything. And this is, a, this is a very sensible way of doing this. I don't want to be carried away with subjective appraisals of companies. I don't want to be carried away with using models. I don't want to get carried away with short-term momentum and CNBC stuff. 
So I'll apply all of it to a comprehensive investment process, and that should allow elements of one to cancel out the exaggerations or flaws in another. The problem with that is that's how you end up with kind of you know an index plus process. And the the so having 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 struggled through all of all of the compromises that are inherent in, in those elements of the process, the 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 final alternative is to say I'm going to try to systematize this process so that we at least can overcome some of the inconsistencies, uh, compromises, and, and so on that are intrinsic to the, to the traditional subjective process. And there are some great, there are some advantages to, to this. Uh, you know, we have tools now that are completely uh, unrelated to to, to what we really started out with. I mean, we, you know, primitive dividend discount models that we were using 35 years ago. I was in, 30 years ago, I was in a, in a database programming class so that I have nothing to do with programming, but I was in a database programming class so that I could literally learn how to program a now obsolete database to create a, a, a way of doing simple factor models on a, you know, 100 stock database. You know, now we have off the shelf, you know, unlimited factors, unlimited numbers of companies, unlimited analytic capabilities. It makes a huge difference. It means that, that an analytic approach can have much broader coverage. You don't have to, you don't have to say, oh no, it's only appropriate for an analyst to cover 20 companies. You can cover every company in the industry if you want to. If you, if you know how to program what you're looking for, you can have better ability to, 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 to analyze trade-offs if you design the system right. You can, be, you, can have a, you can have an analytic system that really doesn't have to take into account what country are you from, what industry are you in, where, you don't, where you're not constantly bumping up against the, well, you don't understand my industry, that doesn't work that way, or the, you have to know how the culture works in this country. When I started as an international investor, it was all about sort of country inside information, and, and uh, that's, that's really obsolete now. We really, really overcome that kind of thing. And, and the other thing that a systematic approach can do is to, is to eliminate the, the, you know, changing the rules for every stock decision that you make, which is, which is obviously a flaw that we are all uh, subject to. But having said all that, and those are, the, those are the virtues of an analytic system, but then you have to design it. So you get into, you, you, you know, and once you've designed it, you're going to apply it. And if you're going to apply it, it should, you, should, you should probably be able to have confidence that it's comprehensive and, it, and, that it, and that it's going to work as planned. So the basic structure here is the first set of trade-offs is what kind of elements. You know, we, we started with valuation-based models, dividend discount models. That's a very, very sort of base approach. Really not, that, 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 that's not the, found, that's, that's the foundation of some research processes now, but it's, you know, you're not going to build a, 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 you're not going to build a firm from the ground up on that basis. Factor models are the, are the second approach where you, where you just take a venue of factors and say, let me see what works. And this is what most people do. Let's, let's see what I got. Quality, how do I define quality? I'm going to define momentum. I'm going to define earnings momentum. I'm going to, you know, figure out figure out uh, factors for valuation, and I might put some, you know, regime overlays on top of that, and score all the stocks, and figure out a scheme to to come up with the preferences and recommendations and so on. And the third way of doing it is the is uh, is is to, is to apply decision rules to say, you 
know, uh, if if this if this stock meets certain quality criteria, then I will buy it if the valuation is better than such and such, and the earnings trend is better than such and such. So, so, so kind of a multi-level uh, factor analysis um, that, that creates a kind of, 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 of decision system. And ideally, if you're going to apply that kind of methodology, what it should do is replicate what your, what your analytical thought process would be as an investor if you were able to apply it impartially and consistently every single time. But still, you're still left with these complicated questions. Do you want to incorporate subjective inputs into your system or not? Or do you want to include them because they corrupt the system? Do you want to be able to, on the other hand, do you want to be able to interpret them subjectively? Do you want to have a system that makes a systematic recommendation for stocks, but then you choose what, which ones to follow or, and how to follow them and how to apply them and, and so on? Do you, do you want the system, whatever it is, to be general or specific? You know, the more general it is, the more consistent it's going to be, but the more specific it is, the better it's probably going to work because, because the dynamics of the valuation and movement of oil and gas is going to be different from the dynamics of the valuation and response of banks, for example. Do you want to have a strategic overlay in the process? Do you want to, do you want to just say, I'll buy whatever the, whatever the stock model tells me to buy? Or do you want to say, well, no, but I'm going to decide what the sector rates are going to be, or I'm going to decide if it's a good market or a bad market, and whether I want to dial up the risk or down, and so on. So these are, these are the critical framework questions that, that, that have to be addressed, even if you know what your objective is. And then you get into the final part of the problem, which is how do you get, how do you get a systematic research process to, to, to translate into, into portfolio construction? Do you do it passively by just accepting, by just turning the, you know, the recommended list into a portfolio? Do you have some kind of portfolio design system that you overlay onto the selection process? Uh, or do you have, what I'm referring to here is a multi-level system, where you say, I'm going to have, I'm going to have one thing, that I'm going to have one system to, de to determine overall risk, one system to determine uh, relative sector weightings, and another system to put stocks into the boxes. Uh, so all of that, all of those become portfolio engineering problems as well. So the, so the scope for mistakes and confusion is just as big in the systematic approach as it is in the traditional approach. And the need for consistency and intellectual integrity is just as great. And because you're really doing the same thing, you're just trying to figure out between the two which is going to subject me to, 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 to fewer biases and to, to better responsiveness to, to market conditions. So we had, this is not the point of this, but we had a chance to do this from scratch, uh, setting up a new, setting up an entirely new firm with a small team with, with the objective of, you know, producing uh, active excess return on a global equity portfolio. We chose to do model-based research. Um, so so we, we, we try to do it at the first level, uh, we, we model yield, growth, and valuation, and try to synthesize that into long-term return projections. And then we overlay on top of that rule-based stock selection, which is, which is basically saying, yes, we want, you know, higher yield is better, but only if, you know, the company isn't about to go bankrupt. And lower valuation is better, but only if the earnings are not about to collapse. So it's, it's that kind of analytics that we, that we put on top of the models to give us, to give us stock selection. We uh, utilize basically a passive portfolio strategy because all of the, all of the, 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 
portfolio matrix of decision rules that we use basically do the, the portfolio strategy for us. Um, and, and we do a, we do a, a, what I'm referring to as algorithmic portfolio construction, which just means how do you define what the size of positions is going to be, what the limits to exposure are going to be, uh, what, this, what, this, what the add and reduce rules are going to be, and what the, what the, uh, what the cell disciplines are. So this, I'm just outlining this as being one way of selecting from all of those design parameters that I, that I reviewed before. But there, are, but there are, can be many others, and, and there will be many others that we'll look at over time. I think, you know, one of the things that, that I was interested in when we started this firm was saying, okay, let's, you know, let's keep the research machine running. I don't want to, I don't want to solve the stock market and consider it done. I want to keep looking back and saying, wait a minute, what about, what about regime analysis? And what about different kinds of regression that can separate time periods into discrete, uh, into discrete realms, does that work better, and, and so on. So I think, I think it's going to be a continuing evolution, and we're going to be continu it's going to be a continuing evolution because the underlying technology is evolving, the underlying theory is evolving, and, and, the, and, the, and the usability of the underlying data is evolving as well. Some of the areas that we find to be of significant interest in, you know, in terms of our next steps on the, on the threshold. One is this whole area of non-normal distributions, which I think has been totally overlooked in financial theory. Uh, and the whole idea that we obviously have skewed distributions of return and skewed distributions of outcomes in um, both in terms of stock returns and in terms of corporate performance. Uh, this is this is obviously something that you know, needs needs more research, especially in the corporate end, where you have all these discontinuities. You know, companies get taken over, they go out of business, they list, they delist, they go private. How does that interfere with your data and your analytic capability? And how do you account for all of that kind of stuff? This, and, and and then and then secondly is this whole question of Bayesian inference. You know, how do you what what's really going on here? One day you have a distribution of prospective returns, and then something happens, and they report a quarter, and the next day you have a different distribution. How do you, how do you account for the movement in, 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 these, in these distributions of uncertainty? And then finally, and this is the most, the most difficult question, is this question of, of do you design a system and run it, or do you somehow let, do you, do you, do you let you know, Watson figure out how to, how to run it? on an ongoing basis, and what's the difference, really? And if you're going to teach a system how to learn to be a system, what do you teach it? And what's the difference between teaching a computer how to learn to invest and just teaching your system how to invest? And I think these are, I mean, that's, a, that's not a trivial distinction, but I don't think we know how to make it yet. So these are, these are just some of the issues that I think um, we're, we're facing. But, but I think the conclusion here is that, the, that the, just as the business of sports went through a revolution, which is not yet finished, I think the, the, you know, the business of active management with a much bigger, richer, and more complex data set uh, applying to it and with much more uh, unbounded rules of engagement, this is gonna, this is gonna, this is gonna mean that the, 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 that the active asset management business of, of 10, 20, 30 years from now is gonna, be, is, is gonna be less and less a recognizable version of what we have today. And that was really what, you know, that was really what motivated us to, to start an analytics-based business. Not because we thought we had the answer, but we thought because we thought we could get to the answer. So with that, I'll stop. Open up for questions. Yeah? Um, I, um, I was wondering, you know, some of the most basic questions I think about when you're talking about this kind of design, do you use reported earnings? Do you use adjusted earnings? Do you use operating earnings? I mean, how do you, uh, uh, just as good as to start, or is that kind of at the end of the process where you look at the results and say, 
you know, our class has to come in, it comes in the beginning. And we do, um, we do two things in, in all of our, uh, in all of our, in, so this, this really applies to our, uh, it applies to all of our models, yield, growth, uh, valuation, and all of our risk models too. <laughs> it applies to all of them. So basically, the one answer is use different measures in, and, 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 and use a, so you, yes, use reported earnings, but also use EBITDA, use cash flow, and, and sort of have some duplication in the, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the elements of the model. And the other is that if we, we explicitly have a, uh, a, 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 a factor in, in our risk model, for uh, the dispersion between uh, between gap earnings and reported earnings, because that's an important that's a that's a pretty important risk factor. Any others? Yeah. Up and running on a, on a, on a live 
basis. And, and basically what we're, what, what the portfolio is doing, is, and I'll just give you a, a little bit of a description. What the portfolio is doing is saying, we have a rule for low risk stocks because we think low risk stocks have a good trade off. We have a rule for high yield stocks. We have a rule for value stocks. We have a rule for high growth stocks. And we have a rule for, for balanced high return. So we select for, we, we categorize rules for each of those groups, select stocks that meet those criteria within each of those groups, and blend them into a portfolio. So what makes it interesting is that you have all these stocks that no individual manager would find compatible with each other that get, that get put into a portfolio, and you get, you get, uh, you get, you get a sort of diversity, you know, in addition to diversification. So that's our, that's our product concept. Yeah. With that process, though, aren't you going to ultimately end up with like this style box problem that they're not, they're not going to? It sounds like you're agnostic to. <coughs> well, if, if yeah, we have, so we have our, we have a. Um, we don't really have any sophisticated material yet, but when we do, it's going to either say multi-style or omni-style, and people might get turned off by that. But that's, so that's a deliberate choice, strategic choice on our part. Yeah? I was thinking back on the distribution of returns. Have you ever plotted them on an annual basis and then just gone back and compared the same if there are any trends, just as how the distribution would play out? Well, yes, we, you know, we looked at it, and, and I think, you know, now that we're through the process of, of getting the portfolio up and running and starting doing all the tests and rules and so on, we got to look at this basic reference material again and say, okay, I remember what we noticed about, you know, returns being skewed and the association between negative skewness and negative excess returns and so on. But how does it really apply over a long period of time, over a wide range of sectors and, you know, it's, it's, it's got to, it's something we, we have to do more, uh, more systematically in more depth. Yeah. On the blending process, is there a way to <clears throat> to uh, blend together all the rules that you have at the at the final stage, so you're optimizing for you know stocks that may score well on all the categories that you're seeking, so score well on valuation, score well on growth, versus just having each individual rule spit out the stocks and you know you market weight each one. Or well, we do have. Um, We do have a, uh, instances, not, not a tremendous number of them, but we have instances where, where stocks will pass more than one rule. Um, and, you know, typically it might be high yield and balanced high return or something like that. Um, and then we have the balanced high return criteria itself, which basically is looking for above average. In, in all of, you know, growth, yield, and valuation. Um, so in a way, we're, we're, we're doing that at, at those two levels. But, 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 we're not, but what we're not trying to do is say, you know, even if you're good in one, you have to be pretty good in all the others. We'd, we'd rather be more eclectic and less Less trying to trying to get one single standard for the portfolio selection. So that's I think the difference between what we do and, and a lot of other quantitative processes is we're not trying to get the you know some some best score single single market for every company and then choose from that. Yeah. <laughs> Do you find that that you have um, more time? Uh, 
it seems like if you're not having to spend a lot of time in a conference room developing an economic outlook and developing a market forecast and trying to look at currencies and stuff, that you're just a lot more efficient in the way you allocate your, your time if you're agnostic to some of those things that seem to you know, can be very disruptive in a firm where people disagree here or whatever. Yes? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, and, and in, in, my, in my previous uh, occupation, I, I, I did it the opposite way. I, I, tried to, I tried to myself be an input into everything, strategy and economics and FX and all that stuff. And I tried to have, I tried to have the team be conscious of, of all of that. And um, so when, when, you know, my evaluation of the value of that was when I got a clean sheet of paper to do it from scratch, I didn't do any of that. So it's not, it's, it, it's just, a, I think it's a positive trade-off. And I, you know, I get, I get 10 minutes in my, on, on, on the way to my office in the morning and there, I listen to CNBC and I'm sort of, close the door and get out and go into the office and say, I'm glad I don't have to think about that anymore today. <laughs> How many names are in the portfolio? What's the expected turnover? But, um, what we wanted to uh, engineer the portfolio process so, so that we would have a fairly concentrated portfolio. We have 50 to 60 stocks, which is, which is global. Um, we, we have a U.S. model, a U.S. only model portfolio that has like low 30s. That's not live yet. But we wanted much more concentration than a typical quantitative portfolio would give. And we, we wanted to, we wanted the best, you know, turnover that we, we, could, we could get. And so far we've gotten you know, our typical test turnovers are right around a one-year holding period, 100% turnover. So, so just for context, an un, unguarded factor-based quantitative portfolio will typically give you, on a global basis, maybe 400 stocks and 300% turnover. So we, we've got a much more traditional-looking portfolio from that perspective. But it's, it's always a compromise between you know, trying to get systematic factors that work and trying to get longer and longer holding period because too many things change over that longer term time frame. Yeah. So earlier on you were showing some of the behavioral biases that pop up, particularly during stress. And one of them was kind of retreating to that institutional story Etc. But I, I think most of the conventional wisdom is that having a clearly defined discipline and sticking to that discipline through different uh, different market cycles and so forth is generally looked at very positive. Is are you offering a different view on that or mm, yes and no, I guess. I mean I, I, I sympathize with the idea that a That, that discipline will help you avoid being inconsistent. And that's really, when consultants talk about that, and when, when plan sponsors look over your shoulder and, and, and you know, warn you about that, it, that's really what they're talking about. You know, they're, they're saying, don't, don't, don't. Don't chase the mood of the moment and stick with your stick with your style. And, and they're also saying, you know, you can probably only be good at one thing. Um, and uh, and I think that there's, I mean, and there, and there obviously have been examples in the past where people have, you know, style drifted their performance into oblivion. Um, but I think, in a, in a, in the sense of, of uh, being a uh, 
if you think holistically as an asset manager who's also an asset owner, or, or who, wants to, to, who, who wants to at least mentally play that role, then you think, well, well you know, I, I don't want to be, well, you know, I don't want to be single style, uh, limited. You know, I think the question really is, and I guess everyone can make up their own mind, the question is, are you, are you, are you single style because you really believe that's the only way to be successful in, in, in managing assets? Or are you single style because you think that the, the, the sort of discipline of graph requires you to limit your scope of interest? And it's, it's a subtle question, but, but you know, I think my, my conclusion was, you know, I, I, there's, there's no evidence for the, for the dominance of one style over, over another over long periods of time. It's just cyclical. So why, you know, why limit the opportunity set if you don't have to? You know, that's, that's obviously that's another element to it is, is this whole thing of, you know, if you're spending your whole time worrying about Facebook, how much can you know about Osaka gas? But if you have, you know, leverageable analytic capability that can that can do that, then you don't have to be in that box anymore. So that's a complicated question. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.